Hi, I'm Heather, and I want to talk to you about designing collaborative work for in-person and home-based learning. In the flex model of blended learning, some of the common modalities we see are the group discussion that launches learners into their independent and collaborative work, and then the closing discussion that brings them back to reflect on what they've just experienced. Today, I want to talk specifically about that collaborative work, one of the key modalities that allows students to work together to put away their laptops oftentimes and really move away from that independent, more isolated online learning that they would do during the independent work and engage with their peers to solve a real world problem or play a game or do a simulation that brings to life what you're learning to helps it be real and relevant and engaging to your students. How do you do that? Well, let's hearken to the jobs to be done theory. There's the famous story of the restaurant that wanted to improve its milkshake sales. And what they noticed was that more than 50% of their customers were buying these milkshakes early in the morning, like at breakfast time. And after a lot of observation, an astute marketer realized that the job those students, those customers were doing in purchasing that milkshake early in the morning was they faced a long, boring morning commute ahead and they simply wanted something that would help their drive not be so boring. And once the fast food chain had that insight, they were able to create a better milkshake experience for those early morning drivers. They were able to make it thicker with more candy in it. And they were able to make that cup just the right shape to fit into the cup holder of a car and so forth. So understanding what type of progress was motivating those early morning customers to pull into the fast food restaurant buy a milkshake and get back in their car. Understanding that helped the fast food chain better design a milkshake. We can apply that same thinking for students. And one observation these researchers made is that there are two jobs that most K-12 students are trying to do in their lives. One is they want to feel like they're making progress every day. They don't want to go to school and feel like they're hitting their head against the wall, that it's wasting their time or that they're unproductive or that they're a failure. And that's a common sentiment among students. They want to feel like they're making progress. And if they can't find that at school, then they'll turn to sports or video games or something else. But most children have this internal motivation to feel like they're learning and making progress in whatever their pursuit is. And then secondly, most children feel internally motivated to have fun with friends. And if they go to school and they're bullied or belittled or ignored, they won't feel like school is a place where they can make the type of progress they want to make in their life. And pretty soon they'll check out of school. They'll say, school's not for me. Conversely, schools that create rich experiences that help students connect with each other and with their teachers help students feel like, man, this is just, this just feels right to me. This is what I want to do. They show up the next day excited to be there. So teachers who can understand this type of design thinking can then design a classroom that better meets your students' needs. So what does this look like in, in application? Well, first, we want to identify the jobs to be done. Now, we've just done that. Feeling like you're making success every day and having fun with friends. Those are just common students' jobs to be done. The next step, though, to design around that is to think about what are the experiences that we need to provide to get the job done perfectly. So with the fast, with the milkshake, it was, we need to have uh, thicker milkshakes and we need them to be really accessible quickly so people can grab them quickly and get back in their car. And then finally, how must we integrate to provide those experiences? So with the milkshake, well, we need to buy ingredients for thicker milkshakes and maybe we need to order different cups and so forth, thick, bigger straws, so forth. And that same process works in school. So after designing, identifying the job to be done, then we think about what are the experiences that we need to provide to help students to get that job done perfectly in their lives? And then how do we need to change curriculum and staffing and um, facilities and schedules to help us deliver those experiences really well. So let's talk about brainstorming the experiences that help our students really feel like they're making fun with friends and feel like they're successful every day. In one workshop I did, we printed up a bunch of what we called prototyping cards. And on these cards, we listed a whole bunch of different student experiences. And then teachers got in teams and they sorted through the cards and stacked them and prioritized them based on the experiences that they thought would help their students satisfy their jobs to be done most effectively. And so some the, the all of the words on this chart are words that were on the prototyping cards. So 
Perhaps your students need individual tutoring to help them feel like they're making success every day and like they're connecting in a fun way with someone else, with the teacher in this case, or with the tutor. Perhaps they need peer coaching for the same reason. Perhaps they need real world apprenticeships and internships and so forth. So this long list is just to give you a sense of the wide variety of experiences that you might brainstorm to help your students feel like they are having fun with their friends and they are making progress in their lives. One of the common experiences that you'll probably land on is some kind of project-based learning or collaborative game. And that's what we're talking about right now. How do you really brainstorm those and then integrate your classroom experiences so they deliver them really nicely? I did another workshop, and this is with some professors in Lithuania, and we were talking about how to create collaborative projects. And so we decided to do it together as a group. And so I invited these teachers to practice engaging in a remote collaborative project with me to solve a real world problem. And I promised them that they would experience structures that support collaborative work, including articulating the goals, rules, resources, and rewards of their project. I promised them that they would identify risks that compromise the effectiveness of collaborative work and that they would analyze implementation structures that help minimize the risks. So I want to walk you through what they did together to give you a sense of some of those same learning objectives. And I told them that we'd begin by a simple get to know you exercise. I live in Austin, Texas, and one of the favorite foods here is tacos, where you get a flatbread tortilla and then put lots of different toppings on it. And that's one of my favorite foods as well. And so we began with a get to know you exercise where people described their favorite foods. We broke into breakout rooms for those introductions. And the norms that we agreed to were to be concise, to stay on topic, and to speak up because people want to hear from you. And so in the first breakout room, the different professors met their team. And so they were grouped into teams of four or five, and they introduced themselves and described their favorite food. And then they each chose a specialty whether they were going to focus on the academic experience for students, the financial experience, the social and emotional experience, or the physical experience. There were four people per breakout room. They had five minutes, and then they returned to the whole group. Then after doing that first breakout room, they moved on to a second breakout room where they worked on developing their expertise, and they didn't meet with their original group. Instead, they went to the breakout room that corresponded to their role in the group. So the person in the group that really wanted to think about the student experience for their academic experience, they went to a breakout room focused on student academic experience. The person in the group whose role was to become smart on the financial experience for these university students went to a breakout room on that topic and so forth. So basically everyone broke into rooms based on the expertise they wanted to develop. And so they were meeting with other educators who were interested in developing that same expertise. And then in the breakout room, they had 10 minutes to go through some material and have a discussion together to increase their expertise on that topic and to brainstorm how to improve the experience for students, either academically, financially, socially, emotionally, and physically, as measured by a 90% increase on the net promoter score. So we, I said, assuming that these university students, you want at least 90% of them to say that they recommend your university, then what would you do to improve the academic financial and so forth experiences. And so anyway, after they developed this expertise, then we came, they went back to their original group for breakout room three and they engaged in their team project. And this time they returned to the original group of four people and they created a slide to share what they had learned from their expert based on their expertise and then create a proposal together. And then they emailed it in and we judged and had prizes, but this is how we created a collaborative project. And excuse me, I think it was a good way of showing how there was a clear deliverable, there was a clear metric they were trying to hit, and then there was a structure that helped this collaborative project be successful. What is collaborative learning? Let's step back and think about this big picture. In theory, research, and practice, uh, Professor Slevin said that collaborative learning is structured, positive interdependence in pursuit of a shared goal. Why collaborative learning? Well, it's one of the most co cost effective of learning strategies. When it is designed well, you can get a lot of learning progress for not as much of an investment as other interventions. 
Um, big gains in academic achievement are possible when it's structured well. Big gains in social and communication skills, which is especially important in this world where there's more and more home-based learning happening. And then also you can have fewer dropouts, more of your organizational goals of more students who are engaged in the classroom because they're feeling successful and they're having fun with their friends. And also it's just an opportunity to focus on relevant real world problems and issues. This is all from the Educational Psychology Journal. Risks to manage when you're developing collaborative work. One, everyone's been in a group project where it feels like one person is doing all of the work and that's a real risk to manage and where it, it can honestly make a project dreadful. So students don't want to be part of it. Another is this idea of pooling ignorance, the blind leading the blind. If no one in the group is expert or capable, then you've just created a group of students who are not able to lift each other up. Uh, other risks that you've experienced. If I were leading a workshop right now, I'd ask you that because everyone's been in some kind of a team project or, or exercise where it wasn't successful. It wasn't a good use of your time. So how do we mitigate those risks? One is that jigsaw method where each person in the group is assigned a role and they are invited to become experts in their role. So in the example I showed you with the university professors, one was to become expert in the financial experience for students, one in the social emotional experience for students and so forth. And then they brought their expertise back. And that's the jigsaw method. Another is to combine group goals with individual accountability. So as uh, the group, perhaps they rate the contribution of each member, perhaps as the teacher, you join the breakout rooms to see how they're doing, but something that allows for individual accountability. And then finally, structure the game. So as you're building collaborative experiences, you are the game maker. Make sure that you define the deliverable. Give some background on the project or game. Suggest some strategies for sharing the work. Suggest some strategies for, for excuse me, strategies for sharing ideas and strategies for dividing up the work. I want to leave you with the thought that you can reach and engage each student this year. You can lead the way. And in large part, you will do that by designing better collaborative experiences with real world relevant problems that are structured as game-like experiences that involve and include each member of the team. By doing that, you will reach and engage your students as never before.